crowding in and crowding out. You bet. Crowding in and crowding out. Okay, first question, please. What are the four components of aggregate demand? Government spending, investment, consumption, net exports. And if you don't remember C plus I plus G plus X for the next year or two, you didn't get much out of this course, right? This is kind of the heart and soul of macroeconomics, so we tend to present the economy. And if we had a situation kind of like this, I'll have to zoom that in when I edit it. Can you see what's going on here? You got the supply curve. Maybe I can find a better blue marker. Maybe I can. The economy's in a recession. There's your supply curve. There's your demand curve. And where this goes vertical, that's your full employment level. So we're down here in a recession, right? What do we call the distance between where we are, Q star, and where we would like to be full employment? What do we call that? The recessionary gap. What do we mean by gap? If, for example, this is 1,600 and this is 1,200, the 400 is the gap, but explain it to me conceptually. What is that $400? The amount we could have produced and sold at, at, if we had full employment. Absolutely correct. Let me say it a little differently. It's the amount of spending we need in order to do what? achieve full employment. It's the spending shortfall. You want to think of it that way? It's the lack of spending that's causing all this unemployment. So we have a recessionary gap. What are the Keynesian fiscal policy options? How do you cure this as far as Keynes is concerned? Say again? Either lower taxes or you increase spending. Everybody remembering all that? I mean, I, that was what was on the first, on the last test, and it's going to be more of it. Have you seen it? Chapters 11 and 12 going to be on this test? Okay. In either case, and here is your explanation now on the, the crowding out and crowding in. In either case, typically, if the government is going to stimulate the economy, right? These would be forms of stimulus. In order to do that, the government would have to borrow money. Which means they go into a deficit. Now, when the government borrows money, they go out there just like corporations and individuals, and they try to borrow it from somebody in exchange for interest. When the government does that, we're a little ahead of ourselves, but we'll talk about it, they issue bonds, a government bond, a U.S. Treasury bond. We'll use $1,000 denominations for a minute. So the bond, if they were printing them up anymore, they don't need to, but if they printed them up, it would say, here's a $1,000 bond. It's got a contract written on it. It says the U.S. government promises to pay whoever loans them the money, let's say interest at 3%. So if you borrowed, I'm sorry, if you loaned the government money, you did that by buying the bond. And when you buy the bond, you give up, technically, you give up $1,000, and the government sends you 3% interest every year 
until the bond matures, until the loan is over, usually 10 or 20 years. You with me so far? So the government's going to pay 3% interest to you or corporations or me or foreign governments or whoever will loan them the money. They're going to be paying interest. But they're going to be out there selling bonds right alongside people like Apple or General Motors or whoever, who also borrow money on a regular basis as part of their business operations. And they also issue bonds, and therefore they also pay interest. You with me so far? So if there's all these businesses and other governments and whatever out there, state and local governments, foreign governments, they're all out there borrowing money by selling bonds. And so now the United States government goes into the same market and says, hey, we'd like to borrow some money too. We have some bonds for sale. Would you buy this bond from Apple or this bond from the government? Why the government? Because if the Apple goes broke, then they don't pay any money. What if the government goes broke? It's your bond secured. So well, the U.S. government bonds are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, right? And we hope that we never default on those bonds, although the Republicans have just about made us do it now a couple of times. They tried to shut down the government's ability to borrow. Which one's riskier? Apple. Apple. If, if, if these guys are paying, let's say they're paying 3%, if, uh, if Strickland's, snappy Strickland auto loans decided to go issue bonds, would I be pretty risky? I'd be damn risky. The chances of me being able to pay you that interest on that bond are pretty small because I'm kind of a shaky guy, right? So if you wanted to loan me money, would you be willing to take 3% interest? No? What would you want? 7 or 15 or having known me now for most of the term, 25, right? You would say that the higher the risk of the bond, the higher return I want to earn, okay? So if I went into this market issue in bonds, I'd have to pay 20%. Okay, so far? So which one would you buy? Let's say that Apple, it's slightly riskier than the government, let's say that Apple's paying 6.5%. Now which one would you buy? You'd still go with the government? Why? It's safer. It's still safer. I'm Anybody would buy, you'd go with Apple, why? Because it would pay me more interest. It would pay you more interest, and? And it would be faster, and maybe with the money I get from the interest, <clears throat> after like a couple of years, I I get back the money I used, I loan them. Could be, and it may well also be, you think Apple's a pretty good company, and they're going to pay the loan off. Okay. So we choose different bonds based on the risk and the interest they're paying. But let's go back here. Apple's been out here borrowing money with all these other corporations, all these other governments. And let's say that on the average, on the average for bonds, bonds are paying, let's say, 4.5%. Now the government comes in and says, we want to borrow bonds. And when they borrow, they borrow a lot of money. We want to sell bonds. Okay. This is one more seller coming into a market to sell something. What happens when anybody sells something? When, when you have new buyer, new sellers coming into the market selling more pet rocks or yo-yos. Prices go down. So now there's a lot more bonds out there. Their prices fall. And when their prices fall, their interest rate, the effective interest rate they pay is going to go higher. Think of it this way. The government goes in and says, oh, we need to borrow some money, too. And people look around and say, well, why should, why should I buy, loan you money instead of them? If you'll pay me more interest, I'll loan you money. And so the, the borrowers are competing for the money to borrow it. And the way they compete is by paying higher and higher and higher interest rates. You with me on that? When the government goes out and starts to borrow more money, that's going to push interest rates up because there's more people out there trying to borrow, just like having more buyers in the market. In this case, they're sellers. 
Here's my point. When the government starts to borrow money, this forces interest rates to rise. I mean, if you were Apple and the government came in to borrow money, wouldn't you have to pay even higher interest rates to keep people loaning you money? Yeah. This is the key element about crowding out. If the government's going to borrow money, it's going to push up interest rates. And the argument says, if interest rates go up when bar government borrows money, that's going to cause business borrowing to fall. Because businesses won't be able to pay the higher interest rates. Some businesses can't pay higher rates, and so they stop borrowing money, and they stop investing in the business, building factories, building inventory. So what you're going to get is an increase in government borrowing and spending offset by a decrease in private business borrowing and spending. And so the net effect is going to be nothing. Nothing changes. That government, by borrowing money, isn't going to stimulate the economy. That government spending, financed by borrowed money, is not stimulatory. It is. It crowds out private business borrowing. Government borrowing crowds out private business borrowing. And so government spending isn't going to help stimulate the economy. That's the argument for crowding out. Question? What if you borrow from another country? Same idea. You're still selling bonds in the bond market, wherever the buyers come from to, to buy the bonds. Okay, so far? Now, this is the key point. The assumption behind crowding out is that higher interest rates will reduce business borrowing, so the increase in government borrowing is offset by a decrease in business borrowing, and all that government stimulus doesn't have much effect. Does that make sense? If government pushes interest rates up and businesses say, whoa, hell, I can't afford to pay that, and so they decrease their spending, it's a wash. More government spending, less business spending, no effect on the economy. That's crowding out. Now, there's a couple of issues out there. If the economy is in a recession, let's say that this happens and the unemployment rate is about, no, oh, nine and a half percent. That's a pretty good recession, isn't it? And you're a business. You make cars, you make shoes, whatever. How's business? Lousy. And so, how much borrowing are you doing today anyway? Not much. So if interest rates go up, is that going to make you borrow less money? Maybe not. Maybe you're not borrowing any damn money anyway because the economy is lousy. And so one of the counter arguments to crowding out is, interesting, but not expected to happen in a recession because businesses aren't being crowded out because they're not borrowing. You with me on that? What if we are at full employment? Business is going to be borrowing a lot of money at full employment? Sure. Business is booming. you got new customers. Sales are up. You need new factories. You need modern equipment. You need to grow your sales force. Businesses are borrowing at full employment. The economy is booming. Now if the government comes in and raises interest rates, what happens? Now businesses look around and say, oh, damn, I can't afford those higher rates. So the argument is at full employment, may very well happen. Oops. So, crowding out. What is it? Higher interest rates crowd out business borrowing. Is it a likelihood 
Is it probably going to happen? Well, it depends on the state of the economy. In a booming economy, probably going to be some crowding out. But why would you want to stimulate the economy if it was booming anyway? You wouldn't. If we're in a recession, will, will there be much crowding out? Arguably not, because businesses aren't borrowing a hell of a lot anyway. The economy sucks. Okay, so far? This is sort of an important point, because the classical arguments tend to believe crowding out happens all the time. And I would submit to you that this is not nearly a problem, as big a problem, in a highly recessed economy. The crowding out is something to worry about only as you get closer to full employment, not when you have millions of people unemployed and businesses not looking to borrow and expand. Okay, so far. But well, I got crowding out. Okay. Turn it around, crowding in. What is crowding in? Crowding in says if business is lousy, so we're in a recession, that when government stimulates the economy, businesses look at that and say, whoa, damn, the government's going to push us out of a recession. What do we need to do to get ready? Borrow money and grow our inventories, modernize our equipment, buy some more trucks for our delivery fleet, whatever, that this is going to help the economy. And so businesses getting ready for a good economy increase investment spending, not decrease it. They increase it. Think that works? Think that's true? Don't know. But that's the argument. That government, when it borrows money, can also create positive expectations by business that cause them to spend more money too, and you get an even stronger effect to stimulate the economy. Okay? So think of it this way. Crowding in, if it occurs, makes stimulatory policy stronger. Crowding out if it occurs, makes stimulatory policy weaker. You following me on those arguments? Crowding in would make stimulus stronger. Crowding out, if it occurs, makes stimulus weaker. All right? 